You know, I love this idea. I love the, when we were looking at uh, the, the four Ds. Uh, this morning, it's going to tie in actually really well to what we're looking at. Um, we're going to have a conversation with, uh, well, Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees. And we're going to find that these guys are, are they, they have the first two Ds down pretty good. Uh, they have uh, the, um, the doxology, or the, the, the understanding, the, the knowledge, the, the doctrine. Um, down pretty well, but they really struggled with the actual outworking of that doctrine. You know, uh, Robert uh, Smigall, uh, it's kind of an interesting name, but he said this, he was a pastor of a big old church in Chicago. Uh, he said this, we teach what we know, but we reproduce what we are. Okay, again, we it's who we are, and I think that's how that plays out with that doxology and, and discipleship that becomes so important uh, to what we do. It's not just to what we know. Now, what we know is important. That's a very foundational thing. It's, it's a very important part of our faith. We have to know what we believe. We have to know who we believe in. Uh, and at the same time, we also want to make sure that we are reproducing uh, that right doctrine in the people that are around us. Um, this idea of we teach what we are and we were, and we reproduce who, uh, what we are. Uh, I, I like this idea is that it's kind of like this idea that, that well, actions speak louder than words. What we do, um, it really does matter. It really does play into uh, how we live our Christian life. It, it does matter. Uh, there's something a lot about living a life that is consistent in word and in deed that's really important in what we're called to in the pages of Scripture. Um, you know, when we look again this morning, we're going to see that there's this, there's this pride in the Pharisees. And there is something very prideful uh, when we lay down a bunch of rules and regulations. Um, and then what we don't do is we don't come alongside people and help them live it out. Right, and so it's part of that is this is discipleship. Uh, so, for example, here's a good example. I think it's a great example. Um, I'm not making a political statement one way or the other, but you think about Obamacare. Um, whether you like it or not, that's that's fine. Um, but there's something kind of weird about it when you think that it's something that they lay down and they say this is something that you have to do, people, but we're going to exempt ourselves from. <laughs> right? Uh, you're going to do what we say, but not what we are doing. We're going to exempt ourselves from this policy. Um, it's not a life of consistency. And so, you know, again, whether you like it or not, it does feel odd, it does feel off. And that is something uh, that kind of strikes at, our, I think, our core and our heart when it comes to justice. And so uh, when arrogant people lecture from on high and they don't do the things that, that, requ that are required of them, um, it's the same things they say, you need to do these things, I'm not going to do these things, it's, it's irksome, right? It bothers us. And I think and it should. Again, it's not a new problem. It's been around for a very, very long time. And this morning, we're going to see how Jesus addressed this issue, specifically with the Pharisees and with the scribes. So, if you do me a favor and turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, I lied, Matthew 23, uh, verses 1 through verse 12. That's where we'll be spending a majority of our time uh, this morning, looking at those, looking at those 12 verses. So remember where we've been. We've been uh, in the Passion Week. We're still in the Passion Week. Jesus is in Jerusalem, probably near the temple. And what he is doing is he has been going back and forth. Uh, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees are asking questions of Jesus. And what Jesus does is then he responds to them and he gives them answers, right? Based on, you know, is it right to pay taxes? Well, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Give unto the Lord what is the Lord's. Uh, we get into this idea of marriage. You know, who, whose wife is this woman who's been married seven times in heaven? Well, you don't understand, Jesus says. There is no giving or um, being received in marriage in the kingdom of God. Um, last week, we looked at a question that Jesus kind of turned the tables on them. And he asked them some questions about um, the identity of the Son of Man. Who is Jesus? Who is the Messiah? Uh, they get about half right. They understand the Messiah as someone who comes down in the physical line of King David, but they miss the whole divine part, that he's actually God in the flesh. And so after he goes through these series of questions with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and um, the scribes, he actually then turns and he addresses the crowd, the people that are standing around and they're watching this whole thing. Okay, so we'll begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 23. And if you'd stand with me and read God's word, that'd be great. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, 
The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, and so and uh, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love to place the places of honor at feasts and at the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Please be seated. So Jesus turns and he looks to the crowd and he says, okay, these Pharisees, they they teach a lot of the right things. Okay, they are sitting in Moses' seat. And this idea of being in Moses' seat um, is significant in that they aren't talking about necessarily a physical seat, although uh, there was a physical seat in the synagogue, especially later that people would sit at, read the scriptures, and then they would expound on the scriptures from there, from that seat within the synagogue. Um, That's not necessarily what Jesus is referring to here. What he is referring to here is he is referring to uh, the authority that these guys have. These guys have an authority from sitting in Moses' seat. Remember that this concept we've talked about time and time again, really, that uh, the one who delivers the message for the master actually carries the same authority as the master, right? So when the servant was sent by the master to go to the fields and tell the workers to do something, it was really the worker's uh, responsibility to obey that command. Because to disobey that command would be not disobeying the servant, but ultimately it is disobeying uh, the master, um, again, uh, like even this morning in our Bible study, we're going through uh, the book of Revelation. And we started that this morning. And uh, one of the opening verses, it talks about how uh, God is, is giving this message to John, but he's using an angel to do it. right? And so the angel is communicating the message to John, but he's carrying the same weight and the same authority as God because it's God's message. Okay, So to, to disobey what John is writing is to be disobeying ultimately God, not even with John or that angel. Does that make sense? And so in the same way, the Pharisees, as they sit on the seat of Moses, they are sitting there carrying that same weight, that same authority of Moses and the teaching that Moses did as they teach the scriptures. And what he's saying is, is that they're actually teaching things well. They're, they're communicating the right ideas, the right principles. Now, if the problem is, is how, they're, how it's playing out in the life around them. What they're doing is, is they are preaching all the right things, but the problem is they are tying up all these like a heavy, heavy burden, and they're placing it on the backs of people. It's heavy for them to bear, okay? spiritually speaking. Um, the other day, I picked up uh, Chloe's backpack, right? And apparently, kids these days they don't they don't use lockers anymore. They have a locker, but they pack all their books into their backpack, and the reason is there's not much passing period. It's only four minutes or something like that, so it's very short. Right, and so I went to pick up her backpack. I'm like, no wonder your back hurts all the time, Chloe. This thing is heavy. All of her textbooks are in there, her pencils and her and her, and her notebooks, and the backpack is full and it's, it's stretched all the way out. It's hard to get zip closed, and it's heavy. Okay, no wonder her back hurts. Same kind of thing. These people are spiritually worn out and they're spiritually tired because the Pharisees continue to, in their pride, right, kind of pour down these truths on the people, but in their apathy. They do nothing to help the people carry the burden. In fact, they, they, lacked, they lacked grace. And so he says this again. Now let's look at this, read it verse, um, the first four verses real quick. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. Um, again, these guys were laying a heavy, heavy burden on the people. Observe what they're telling you to do, because they're teaching the right principles, but they don't do what they do. Because how it's playing out uh, is very much, uh, you know, it's very wrong, what they're doing. Again, it kind of gets back to do as they say, not as they do kind of mentality, right? Uh, I remember as a kid growing up, whenever I would catch an adult, or we kids would catch an adult doing something contrary to what they've told us to do, right? 
I was like, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're doing this, but you told me yesterday not to do that. Well, do as I say, not as I do. Okay, if, if you're a parent, you might have used that line. Okay, I know I'd use that line. And that's not in one of my greater parenting moments, <laughs> right? But you know, it's easier to deal with it that way and get the kid going on down the road with life sometimes. Um, now, it's starting to kind of come back and, and, and haunt me a little bit because now uh, the kids, now that they're all driving, uh, they tend to pick up on all the little mistakes I make when I drive. Um, so I'm not always the greatest at using the turn signal, especially when I change lanes. And so the kids are constantly telling me, Dad, use your turn signal, right? So they're catching me doing as I taught them to do. So I always tell them, make sure you use your turn signal, signal so people know where you're, cut, where you're going, that you're going to be changing lanes, that you're making a turn here, it's, it's for safety. When I don't do it, they say, hey, Dad, you're not doing what you told us to do. Okay? Um, do as you say, do as I say, not as I do. Um, so, so they, they're, they're doing, they're kind of, unfortunately, like, we're all people, we all have shortcomings. For me, driving is one of those, potentially, I guess, right? Um, but these guys, they're preaching. She says, listen to what they preach, but don't do as they practice. Their teaching wasn't the problem. It was the failure to live out their own teachings. That is the problem. Jesus, here he calls out these religious elites, and essentially he's calling out their hypocrisy. They're, they're, they're hypocrites. They're, they're play acting. They're saying one thing and they're doing another. And so he's explaining here what this, what this, what this hypocrisy, what it looks like. They type these heavy burdens that are hard to bear. They place them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move a finger to help the people. Um, they're teaching the Mosaic Law accurately as they are reading and as they are expounding on it. Um, the problem is, is they're also adding a lot of rules and regulations to those things. Right, so in the law, there's a certain set of a certain number of rules. A lot, you know, we think of the Ten Commandments, for example. Um, but even just with the one commandment to obey the Sabbath, there was probably ten or twelve other commands that the Pharisees brought up that said you have to do these things to adhere to the command of God. So they're tying up this heavy, heavy burden. And they're laying it on people. There's no way that people can really uh, adhere to these things, and they lack the grace to stoop down and to help the people in adhering to the commands that God has, has given them. Really, what is it? It's antithetical to the heart of God. Um, God desires to give us rest. He doesn't desire to hot, give us rule after rule and obligation after obligation. He desires to give us rest. Um, and so uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Okay, These, these verses kind of build on each other a little bit. Um, so the first one here it says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets, Jesus said. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. And so we understand then that the law is still in effect, but the cool thing is, is that we can't fulfill the requirements of the law on our own. Jesus has done that on our behalf. He came and he, he lived the perfect life um, in his humanity and in his deity. Remember we talked about that last week, the hypostatic union, there's there's his, his divinity and his humanity are woven together in such a way that in the one Jesus, um, he's able to accomplish God's purposes for salvation. And Jesus does that in part by fulfilling all of the requirements of God's law on our behalf. And so that when he goes to the cross, he is the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So then when he goes to the cross, not only does he just take away, or not only does he absolve us of our sin, but he actually becomes sin. And God pours out his wrath on sin, putting to death Sin. That principle of sin is now dead and it's done away with. And so that all those of us who are in Christ, we, we, we are perfect in our standing before God. Okay? Now, we, we're not perfect people. We still sin. We still, we still make mistakes. We, we still fall short. But Jesus has, he's taken care of that principle of sin. So those of us who place our trace, uh, faith and trust in him, now all of a sudden we, we find ourselves in a place where uh, we are now set free from the consequences of our sin. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. That's exactly what he did. And because he fulfilled the requirements of that of the law for us, that burden of the law that, that rests on the shoulders of people, it's heavy, it's weighty, and, and, but the thing is that Jesus is taking care of it by fulfilling it. He tells us in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The burden the Pharisees placed on people was very heavy. It was burdensome. Jesus says, no, 
take my burden. Uh, my burden is light. I, I, I've already paid. I've already taken on that heavy burden. I've taken that on for you so that you don't have to carry that weight. You don't have to carry that burden. Take my, take my yoke. Right? The yoke is that thing that goes that, that wood that goes over the oxen's shoulders that they, as they pull a load, as they pull a wagon. It was take mine. Mine is easy. Mine is light. I've dealt with it for you. You don't have to deal with it anymore. I've fulfilled the requirements of the law. And this is the heart of God. The heart of God is to give us rest. The heart of God is to give us peace. And so in verses 5 to 7, Jesus kind of lays out for us what, what is in the heart of the Pharisees. In other words, what is in this prideful heart? He says, they do all their deeds, he says in verse 5, to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the places of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. And so what he does is he, he reveals their motivation and why there's pride in their hearts, right? They, they are proud, proud guys. And, and they're, they're seen doing the right things, the righteous things. And they, they look the part, but the problem is there's, some, there's something wrong with their, with their motivation, with their attitude. And so the first, the first thing they take pride in, Jesus says, is in their adornments. Their adornments. Okay, their phylacteries and, and their the tassels or the fringes of the robes. Uh, now, phylacteries, says their phylacteries are broad. Now, the phylacteries, um, they were wooden or leather boxes that were made. And what they would do is they would take pieces of scripture and, then the, and they would roll them up and they put them in these phylacteries and then they actually bind them to their foreheads. Okay? And, and they would walk around with these phylacteries on their heads and they had big ones. Apparently they're putting a lot of scripture in there. Okay? They also would take these leather bands or throngs and they'd kind of wrap them around their arms. Um, and they, they did this basically in accordance to what you see in, in scripture, where, where God says in Exodus 3.19, for example, there's a few places we see this, but in Exodus 13 is one of them. It says, and it shall be done to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth for with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. So they take these passages very literally. And so they take these, these phylacteries and they, and they wrap put them on their head. They put scripture in there. It's, it's to be, uh, to remind them of God's law and God's words. Now it, they do it today still. It's not something that was just done back in the day. If you were to go to, so about, I don't know, several years ago, I got to go to uh, Israel. And when we were in, uh, even in the airport, uh, on the flight that was taking us over there, you saw a lot of Orthodox Jews, and they, they were walking around. Many of them had these phylacteries on their head. A lot of them had the things wrapped around their arms. Especially when you get to the Western Wall, where you can go and you can pray, the oldest stones of the, of the Temple Mount are, are still there, right? the ones that were laid by Solomon. And so they can go up to that, and they can put their hands on these stones that were laid by Solomon, um, and, and they, they pray. Right? And many of them take they have their phylacteries on, and they have, they have these bands going down there. It's, it's a reminder of God's law. Then you have their, the, the tassels, right? the, the, the fringes on, on the, the base of, their, of, their, of their, their robes. Now, the reason those were there, God said um, in the Old Testament, he says, put on the base of your, of your robes in the four corners these blue tassels that, that are hanging down. And these tassels are to hang down. They're blue. They're to remind you um, about me, right? They're to remind you about the things uh, of God. They're a reminder of God's law, okay? And so they have these phylacteries and they have these tassels, and for some reason, the Pharisees make their phylacteries broad, make them big, and they make their tassels long. It makes you wonder if they're trying to compensate for something, right? Like bad doctrine, <laughs> it's important, right? They're compensating for bad doctrine, um, but they but they want to look the part. The bigger the phylactery, the more holy, the more pious they are. The longer their tassels, the more holy, the more pious they are. So they have a lot of pride in those things. They they take pride uh, in sitting in the places of honor. Now, in that culture, the closer you sat to the host, uh, the higher, more elevated you were in the eyes of of that host, right? So if you sit in the furthest part, the furthest spot away from the host, you were probably in the host size anyway, you were the least. But if you sat right at the right hand of the host, you were something special. And it said something to everybody in the room that you were something important, you were something special to the host. And so they love to be in those seats of honor. They love to sit in those places at, at, at banquets because uh, it said, look at me, I'm important, I am somebody. 
They like to sit in the places of honor in the synagogues, right? So the closer they could get to the front, uh, more people could see them and they could show off their big phylacteries and their long tassels and they would look more uh, important. It was a very much a prideful thing. They want to sit in these places of, of honor. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces. You know, they, they say that the sweetest word in any language is a person's name, right? And there is something that's kind of cool about when someone remembers your name, um, when you walk up to them in the street and say, hey, Dave, nice to meet you. It's good to see you again. And oftentimes when that happens, if you've met the person once or twice, usually my mind is spinning from the place them, right? But it does feel good when they remember my name, which is why I feel so terrible when I don't remember their name, right? So these guys love to be greeted in the marketplace. They love to be recognized. They love to kind of be the rock stars of that time period. People loved them. People greeted them. Uh, people felt important getting to know them, and they felt important because their, their status in everyone's eyes around them, these guys were elevated. They were high. They were prideful. Um, they liked to be looked up to as teachers of Israel. They liked uh, the praise and the honor that came with being a rabbi. They saw their positions as really much less about the teaching of God's word, and it's more about self-gratification. They liked to be elevated. They were prideful in their hearts. Uh, these prideful men, again, they were more concerned with their own adulation, with the benefits of their position, than fulfilling their God-given role as the shepherds of Israel. They were to shepherd. They were to love people well. Now, do we remember now what God requires? In contrast to the Pharisees and, and, and their prideful hearts, what does God, the Lord, require of us? Saw this a few weeks ago, right? In Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? There's supposed to be, there's a, there's a humility of heart that God calls us to. And this does not define the Pharisees or the scribes. They were prideful. They weren't kind. They weren't just in their treatment of people. They left it up, placed heavy burdens on the people. Um, they wouldn't stoop down to help their, their, their people. They weren't the good shepherds that they were called to be. They were meant to serve. and They aren't servants. They enjoyed being served, be recognized, to have their, their egos stroked. So now he's going to switch gears a little bit, Jesus will. He's told us about the shortcomings of the Pharisees. Uh, and now he's going to tell us a little bit about what is better. So look in verses 8 through 10. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor in Christ. Now this seems like a kind of a, kind of a weird sentence or a weird call, okay? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense to our first century mind, but it, he is, what he's doing is he is giving us an understanding about why these guys shouldn't be proud. The reason these guys shouldn't be proud is actually found here in this call to, well, what ultimately is a humble heart. This is what a humble heart looks like. Okay, so there, there, are, three, there are three terms that Jesus uses here. The first is rabbi. Um, a rabbi is a teacher. That's what that word actually translates as. It means teacher. Um, these guys taught in public, the public arena, the public square. They taught disciples. They taught large, large crowds. Okay, the second term that Jesus uses is the term Father, call no one father because you only have one father who is in heaven. That's a reference back to the early church fathers, the, or not church fathers, but the fathers of Israel, right? The patriarchs, okay? Their teaching. You look at their teaching, you look at the teaching of the rabbis throughout time, these, these uh, you know, the, the fathers of the Jewish faith, um, and not only ethnically, but also religiously, they would, they would refer back to those people and, and they would say, don't call anybody father, okay? Again, it's another form of teacher, and then the last word he uses is the word teacher or instructor. And it seems kind of redundant, but it's a different word being used. It's actually a word that actually refers more to a tutor rather than uh, someone who teaches a large crowd. And so if you've ever had to have help in math or science or anything like that, you have someone that comes and kind of does some private one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two kinds of teaching, that's what he's referring to here. Okay, so don't call anyone rabbi. Don't call anyone father. Don't call anyone teacher. Again, it's getting at, at, don't call anyone. Um, these are all the people who, whose job it was to, or is to expound on the word of God. Why is that? Because we only have one true teacher.
teacher, one true father, one true instructor, and that would be God himself. Again, why should we not do this? Well, think about the prideful hearts of the Pharisees. Um, there's something about elevating people higher than they need to be that causes them to begin to believe that they deserve more privileges. That they need to have a higher status. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of pastors um, that make it, that have a lot of pride in the fact that they are pastors, and they like to be the pastor, and they like to be patted on the back and to be greeted in the foyer and to have people come to them and kind of fawn over them and guffaw over them and, and stroke their egos because that's because they are a pastor and take a lot of pride in that. And we see that all the time. The problem is, is that's not what we are called to. Um, it's about desiring to hear from, from God and elevating him, magnifying God, not the pastor. The goal on Sunday mornings is that as I stand here and I'm preaching God's word is that you're not hearing me, hopefully. God does use me, um, but I'm only a tool. <laughs> and, um, that also may be true. Um, a, a, a utensil, is that better? Um, a conduit, thank you. That <laughs> sounded way better in my head than they did when it came out. Um, Anyway, hopefully I'm just the conduit, I like that word, the conduit through whom God uses to, to speak to you. Um, hopefully I'm hidden behind the cross. Hopefully um, you're hearing God speaking to your heart, the Holy Spirit stirring in your soul rather than me. Um, I know the reality is, is I know me well enough to know that I got enough issues. I got enough problems in my own life. I, I'm no one to um, seek out much information from. But, you know, God is. God is, and so that's what we do. We, we, we look to God to give us wisdom and guidance and, and to teach us. Jesus says that we are brothers. And I'm going to include sisters, right? We are brothers and we are sisters. We are on the same playing field, okay? And so, so there's no reason to elevate a pastor, put him on a pedestal. It's a, it's a bad place for the pastor to be for the church as well as for the pastor, I think how this kind of plays out for us in the church today is that we have actually just substituted the term senior pastor and replaced, you know, and, you know replaced rabbi with senior pastor. Um, again, I mentioned there's a lot of arrogant pastors out there that take a lot of pride in that position as, as a pastor. I, I think what Jesus is telling us here is we need to regard our, uh, change our thinking in regard to how we view church leadership, especially that pastoral role and the church, because I think what we see is, is that the pastoral role, the teaching role, is less of a position in the church than as a role within the church. Okay, so for example, in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, Paul writes this. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, you see in here, shepherds, teachers, there, right? That's typically what we attribute to a pastor. That's not really a role in the church. I mean, it's not really a position in the church, is it? No, it's a role that within the body of Christ. So God has given to different people, different talents, different abilities, different giftings, so they would use those gifts within the life of the church. And the idea is that we use the giftings that we've been given for the edification of the body, which is why we are to meet together, we're told in Hebrews 10, right, 10.25. Do not forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but we meet together, right, edifying one another, especially as we see the day approaching, Jesus coming back. So, so the role of pastor is just a role within the church. It's not a position in the church, it's a role within the church. You know, I, I think about even our own, our own elder board. Each of these guys, they have different giftings, right? There, there's there's like, well, like three or four of us, and each are designed a little bit differently, and that's the way it's meant to be, right? Um, because we have a role to fill in the life of the church to equip you guys for, the, for doing ministry, not to do all the ministry. Because when you look at this, we typically say, okay, our pastors should be the apostles. They should be the groundbreakers. 
They should be the prophets. They should be the ones that are setting direction and vision. They should be the evangelists. That's why we bring people to church so the pastor can save them, quote unquote. Right? Uh, that's why we have shepherds and teachers. That's why the pastor is a shepherd and a teacher. That is not a, a position. It is there are different roles within the life of the church. And so because, because of that, that puts us all at the same playing field. All of a sudden, we can humble ourselves, we can humble our hearts and say, you know what, I am just fulfilling a role that God has given me within the life of the church. The role that I am functioning in right now is just a role that God has given me in the life of the church. Now, no more or less important than the other roles that God gives to people within the life of the church. So elders, for example, are to be humble shepherds of the church. Peter writes this in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3. He says, So I exhort the elders among you as, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Okay, so it's, again, we have this idea that elders are to be humble servants within the church. Okay, they, they are called to do a job in shepherding the flock of God. This is not what the Pharisees were doing. They were doing the opposite. They were just kind of preaching down, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. And, you know, look how great we are. I got the big old phylactery and I got the long tassels and life is good. I'm not going to help you do any of this stuff. I'm not only going to shepherd you. I'm just going to keep keeping up rules and rules and regulation after regulation. And you're just going to kind of eventually be crushed underneath the weight of the law that we are laying on you. That is not what we are called to in Scripture. We are called to shepherd the flock of God that is among us. We are to exercise oversight, right? Without compulsion. We, we, we are to be in the midst of it, We're working together, edifying body together as we build up the body together to do the work of the ministry. So we're equals. We serve together. Now, the attitude that we are to have is seen in verses 11 and 12. It says, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And I like to call this the great reversal, right? Because it's, it's, everything's it's backwards to how we would think of it. Right? We, we think of power, we think of esteem as, as the ultimate goal. Right? We want to be esteemed, held high, seen at the top of our profession, right? be the best at whatever we do. We like the glory, we like to be exalted. Um, but Jesus says, you know what, when it comes to your heart and the attitude that you have, it's really a humble heart is the one that I will. And he's the only one that matters. Right? It's the humble heart that God glorifies. It's the humble heart that God exalts. Right after we read that passage in First Peter just a second ago about what the elders are to do, and, and then verses and verse, uh, verses five, verse four, the very next verse in First Peter, Peter writes this, and he goes, "And when the chief chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory." Right. So we have a humble heart, a heart of service, and we are humbling humbling ourselves before God and before other people. Then what we understand is that is the heart that God uh, exalts. Philippians 2.9, we're told that because of the humility of Christ, he took the form of man, he died as a criminal for our sake. Because he humbled himself to do these things, we are told that God, is going, God has given him a name that is above all names. Because he was humble, he was exalted. And I think the same is true for us. When we humble ourselves and we walk humbly before other people, when we walk humbly before God, that is how we are made great in the kingdom of God. We may, be, we may be pitiful in the eyes of men, right? Paul was seen as pitiful in the eyes of men. I'm sure towards the end, Peter was seen as pitiful in the eyes of men, especially as they're awaiting their execution. Throughout history, as the church has been persecuted, though the church has been seen as pitiful in the eyes of men. But the amazing thing is, is, in the kingdom of God, they are honored and they are glorified. Again, I love that, I love that passage in Micah. I'm going to read it again, because I think it kind of hits home to, to the attitude that we are being called here to. He says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. We are to be humble before God. We are to be humble for other people. Right? The great confession, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. We are to love people well. We are to be humble before people. When we look at how Christ loved the church, how did he do it? He gave himself up for her, right? Because he, he loves her, and, and, he, and he sacrificed. He was, he was humble. He washed the feet of his disciple. I mean, time and time again, we see humility as being at the very heart of, of, of God. And that's what he calls us to do. He calls us to be people that, that, are, that will be exalted in his kingdom through our humility before him and before others. That's the, that's the encouragement, right? That, that, that's, that's the challenge. Um, to put away our pride and to be humble and be humble. Humble people. They're, they're defined by, by our love, our service, our grace, our mercy. Um, not because those things are necessarily innately found in any of us, but because those are things that are part of God and His character, and we are filled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, those things become a part of who we are. Those are the, the fruits that we will bear. And it all starts with having a humble heart before God. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you again for our morning, and just thank you for the time that you've given uh, to us to be here. And I just pray, Father, that as you uh, lead us out of here, we would be led out of here with hearts that are humble before you, uh, that we're led out of here with hearts that are um, increasingly representative and reflective of, of you and who you are uh, to the world around us. Uh, that, Father, we do want to walk humbly before you and we acknowledge that, that we need you. You are God and we are not. Um, and everything in life that we have is because of you. Everything that we are is because of you. When we are in need, um, you meet us and, and you provide. And when, when things, when we have an abundance um, it is because you have been gracious to give us an abundance. Uh, Father, we want to be humble before those who are around us. Uh, we want to serve the church. Uh, we want to serve one another. We want to find ways to use the gifting and the talents that you've given to us to edify the body that you have placed us in. Uh, Father, we uh, pray that you help us to be humble before the community who is around us, uh, that, that they would that they would be uh, drawn to you through us. You use us to draw them to you um, through our humble hearts as we find ways to serve um, those in our community. Father, we would again have that humble heart, humble attitude before you. Um, not because we seek glory, um, but because we know a natural, I mean, a natural result of that is that you are going to glorify your children and your church. And uh, Father, we're thankful that we're a part of that. And so I pray this morning that you would just continue to help us uh, to set our pride aside and to be humble before others and to minister on your behalf to those who are around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.